welcome to the television series entitled Discovering Orthodox Christianity. I'm Stacey Spanos, your host for these programs, which are designed to explain the basic teachings of Orthodox Christianity. We're honored to be filming at the Holy Cross Chapel on the campus of Hellenic College, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in beautiful Brookline, Massachusetts. And we know that you'll learn so much about our faith and traditions. So in today's program, we'll discuss the Bible in the Orthodox Church, specifically the Old Testament. Our guest on the program is Reverend Dr. Harry Pappas, pastor of Archangels Greek Orthodox Church in Stamford, Connecticut, and adjunct professor at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary in Yonkers, New York. Father Pappas is a specialist in the Old Testament, having earned his PhD in the subject. So thank you and welcome. It's good to be here. First of all, who wrote the Old Testament, Father Pappas? Traditionally, the Old Testament was written by the prophet and lawgiver Moses, the first five books, then by other figures as the prophet Isaiah, the uh, king and prophet King David, uh, Solomon, his successor, and many other of the prophetic figures and wisdom figures that are recorded in Scripture. We know on the basis of a lot of contemporary scholarship that while traditional authorship has been given, assigned to these very important figures, that oftentimes there are portions of the Old Testament that we are simply not aware who exactly wrote it, even if they were ascribed to these major figures like Moses and David and Isaiah. So how did it come into existence? It started through storytelling, the best that we can gather, maybe about 4,000 years ago about the time that the patriarch Abraham had been called by God out of what is now present-day Iraq and to travel to a land that he did not know. From then, the stories began about God's interaction with Abraham's family and lineage and the people that came from them, the people of ancient Israel, the people from whom Jesus Christ came. And from storytelling, there emerged uh, the re recording of events events like the call of Abraham, stories about the creation, the exodus in Egypt, the wilderness wanderings, the establishment in Cana where the promised land. And then uh, from royal decrees, once God's people were set up with their own government, then um, sayings of prophets that were either written down during their lifetime or after that, as well as recording of wisdom figures like Solomon in books like the Proverbs. Do we know at what point it was bound into book format and disseminated to the masses? We don't have any reliable record with exactitude, but the best that we've been able to establish with the result of a lot of contemporary scholarship as well as ancient wisdom is that the first part and most significant part, traditionally, the Torah or the law, really came into being in the Babylonian exile about 580 years before Christ was born. Then there were other writings of prophets, recordings of the kings, chronicles, and wisdom literature that came about in ensuing, that were finalized in centuries that followed the Babylonian exile. Who are the most important figures in the Old Testament? Without a doubt, uh, the most important figures would be Adam and Eve, the first created human beings, uh, then Noah, uh, above all, Abraham as the first called of God's people and the father of all believers, uh, David, the first king of Israel, Moses, the prophet and lawgiver, and the prophet Isaiah. Those would be the greatest of the figures of the Old Testament. What are some of the most important events to come out of the Old Testament? Without a doubt, uh, the event of the exodus from Egypt is the event of the Old Testament. It is the time when God's people had been oppressed for hundreds of years in Egypt, and they were liberated by a God who finally heard their prayers of a cry out of this oppression to lead them through Moses, through many acts of deliverance to cross the Red Sea, to go through the wilderness wandering to inherit the promised land, after that, the most significant event would be the Babylonian exile when God's people, the southern kingdom of Judah, were taken into exile about 580 years before Christ was born because that was the greatest tragedy that ever happened. And from those events, 
uh, or rather I should say in between those events, the most significant thing would have been the establishment of King Chum and kingship with David, because David as Messiah, which refers in the Old Testament not to a future figure, but to a reigning anointed king to govern his people in this world, in this life, from that time, from that establishment, uh, comes the dynamic of who is Messiah that will finally fulfill David and finally bring God's rule and reign in this life. What books do you believe are the most important when it comes to studying the Old Testament? Uh, in my estimation, the books of Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, the Psalms, and Isaiah would be the most important parts of the Old Testament for and why? us. Uh, Genesis lays the foundations of creation, of what it means to be human, of the original state in which we're created, uh, how we corrupted and lost that great privilege, what God kept doing to restore and heal us to our promised inheritance, and how that works itself out through the call of Abraham and his, his uh, successors, his, his descendants, Isaac and Jacob and the people of Israel, Exodus, because it records the call of Moses, the deliverance of God's people from the Exodus and the beginning of the movement to Promised Land, Deuteronomy, because it's the summary of God's teachings and commandments that establishes how they are to live forever and includes many important uh, things that look f towards taking possession of the Promised Land and living as a settled people. The Book of Psalms, because that's the most quoted in the New Testament, and it is the heart of Orthodox worship and is the book of prayer from which we learn how to pray. And Isaiah, because he's considered by the great fathers of the church to be the fifth evangelist, because from that book, more is gleaned and pertains to the life and especially the passion, death, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The New Testament seems to have a feeling of love and compassion. These are the teachings of Jesus. In the Old Testament, God seems vengeful and angry. Why is that? The Old Testament it records a far longer period of history than does the New and includes God's revelation at a particular time and place for a particular people. So therefore, it does not contain the fullness of all that God has to reveal, but while there are times where God does appear to be angry and vengeful and wrathful, there are many other portions of the Old Testament that are simply not known where God is extraordinarily loving and compassionate and forgiving. The Old Testament over a much longer period of time was written where people, the God's people were in circumstances that involved warfare, conquest, dealing with hostile powers, dealing with foreign religious traditions that were alien and threatening to their own viability as the unique separated people of God. The New Testament, by contrast, deals with the fullness of revelation in Jesus, through Jesus, the Messiah or Christ, a much shorter period of time and involves a time where God's people do not have control of society or an ability to defend themselves in, a, in some military fashion or to manifest their own desires when threatened through ways other than suffering and persecution. You just brought up, Gen or you had brought up Genesis, and, and I wanted to ask you about an issue that some theologians bring up with Genesis, even some lay people, that there are two different creation stories. Explain what the differences are. Well, we, uh, people typically refer to Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two as two different creation accounts. They both differ in terms of language and content and even thrust. However, the best way to understand them now is to see Genesis chapter one as setting the theological spiritual parameters and outline by which to understand the more specific story in Genesis chapter two. So we learn different theological and spiritual lessons from each understanding chapter two, not to be separate from chapter one, but rather a further refinement and detail of what chapter one provides on a larger scale. Well, explain to us the differences. Well, the differences include that God speaks and creates by a word alone in chapter one, whereas in chapter two, he's working with material, clay, to form human beings. In chapter one, there is a great deal of attention to the creation involving water, 
whereas in chapter 2, there's a great attention to dry land. Uh, there are different, in chapter 1, God is, creates human beings, male, female, instantaneously at the same time. Whereas in chapter 2, God creates the man, Adam, first, then from him creates the woman, Eve. Some of the differences between the two. And so which one are we to digest, to believe? Both. <laughs> because chapter 2 gives us inform detailed information that chapter 1 simply doesn't provide. And because our ancient Hebrew ancestors who provided us these inspired stories were simply not as concerned as maybe we American Christians might be in having everything to be completely harmonized, they had no problem with distinct and different angles of the creation story, just like they had with different angles of the flood account or of the establishment of kingship later in the Bible, where you've got details that don't always fit together, but they're part of a wonderful, multifaceted story that has different angles to it that can all just be harmonized, squeezed into one nice, neat narrative. Some of the stories from the Old Testament seem to defy reality. For example, Methuselah living to the age of 1,000, Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt. A lot of people question the story of Noah's Ark. Yes. How are we to take these? Which stories are reliable, which are not? Understanding the Old Testament today involves us knowing what kind of literature we're reading when we read the Old Testament itself. Since it's composed over many centuries and involves many different kinds of writing, I will compare this to how we would read a newspaper today. If we pick up a newspaper, it would be disastrous to read an editorial the same way we'd read a news report or a comic strip the same way we'd read an advertisement. Okay. So in the Old Testament, we have different kinds of writing. And the earliest chapters of Genesis, chapters 1 through 11, are typically sacred stories that are inspired by God but are not the same as historical counts in the books of Samuel and Kings about the rise of Saul and David and Solomon and the establishment of the kingdom uh, uh, and the kingship. So therefore, when we read about Methuselah as a great uh, descendant of Adam and Eve living to be a thousand years old, we must understand that this is part of sacred story, not a part of history writing. So there is a s symbolic way of understanding that that, that doesn't necessarily have to read it as a literal 1,000-year life cycle, but understands how the life cycles diminish over time because of the impact of sin, and that God eventually establishes a life cycle, a lot upper limit of about 120 years, only to preserve us human beings from falling into greater sin because of longer life spans, and that, by contrast, these, the ancient story of Methuselah compared to the ancient Babylonian creation myths is far more reliable because in the ancient Babylonian myths that predate our sacred stories, the lifespans were 20, 30, 40, and 50,000 years, and these were much less. With uh, Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt, once again, we have very ancient stories, and it's simply impossible for us to know some degree of what actually happened in history, though that may not even be the most important part because history is not just a matter of what happens, it's a matter of how we understand it. Sure. And the way we understand history is significant in Scripture so that there is no story in the Bible without interpretation and understanding that's inspired by God's Spirit. There is a lot of history documented in the Old Testament, stories about kings. Why should that matter to us? It matters because all the stories of God's people are a foundational to us understanding who we are as Christians today. It would be the same as if I were to visit you and let's say there would be a death of a loved one in the family and everyone would be around talking about stories of what that person meant in their life. So just as I could not get a sense of who a relative of yours might be without the stories told about person, character, places, people, events, humorous, sad, boring in the middle. So for us as believers, this, all of the stories 
of our spiritual ancestors, the ancient Israelites, the apostles, the great fathers of the church and the saints is all important because it helps inform us as to how we are today and we learn a great deal from both things they did well and faithfulness to God, things they didn't do well. And so it's all written and inspired for our moral instruction, even today, just as the apostles taught us. Does the Orthodox Church honor the great figures of the Old Testament, and if so, how? Emphatically, the Orthodox tradition has honored all the Old Testament figures as glorified saints, right along the apostles of the New Testament and the martyrs, the church fathers and the great ascetics, with feast days, and above all, this is especially apparent on the Sunday before Christmas, when in the Matins or Orthro service, in the Synaxarian or commemoration, we read all the Old Testament ancestors of Christ, from Adam and Eve, all the way through the patriarchs and matriarchs, uh, the kings and queens, including the prophets and prophetesses, because they were women prophets, and the righteous and noble figures, up to his own parents, Mary and Joseph. Do we know how important the Old Testament was for Christ? We do. We, we have a sharpened understanding of this. Jesus would have grown up in a very devout Jewish household. In that household in Nazareth, he would have been instructed by the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary, on a daily basis about who we are as a people, the stories of the patriarchs, Abraham and the rest, of the Exodus, of the kings, uh, David and Solomon, of the judges like Samuel, of the prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah. Jesus would have attended synagogue faithfully every Saturday. He would have heard the Old Testament Psalms. He would have heard the prayers. He would have heard sermons. He would have heard readings from the Torah, from the prophets. It would have informed his life from the inside out so that as he emerged into adulthood, the Old Testament, which was the only Bible he would have known, was inside his mind and his heart, operating through all of his ministry. And how did he incorporate the Old Testament in his ministry? Uh, well, we have an example in the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 through 7 of Matthew, where he explicitly is referring to having come not to destroy the Torah, the commandments and the stories of God people enshrined in the first five books, but rather to fulfill them. We also have examples of how he takes the commandments of the Old Testament and radically internalizes them so that it's not no longer simply a break in one's relationship with God to commit adultery, adultery in actual fact externally, but now even thinking about it internally breaks our relationship with God. He referred to Old Testament figures in his first uh, sermon at, uh, back in Nazareth where he grew up. In Luke chapter 4, he refers to the prophets uh, Elisha and Elijah and things that they did. Uh, he is praying the Psalms even as he's dying on a cross, Psalm 22. Uh, and his entire ministry focused on the inbreaking kingdom absolutely has everything to do with what the Old Testament says about who God is who we are, what the creation is all about, and how God wants to organize our life in this world. I know some Christians who have never even cracked open the Old Testament. In fact, you can buy copies of the Bible, just the New Testament. How important is the Old Testament to us as Orthodox Christians? Following what uh, the apostles and the fathers have taught, I would say it's of critical importance because the, old, the New Testament is written out of the raw material of the Old Testament. And the gospel stories of Jesus are precisely in understanding Jesus on the basis of the Old Testament. So therefore, without understanding the Old Testament, we can't understand the New. We will misunderstand the New Testament. We will misunderstand liturgy, epistle, gospel, and the, and the hymns of the church. Whereas the better we understand the Old Testament, the better we understand the New, and vice versa, the New Testament reveals and helps understand and interpret the Old Testament in ways that could never have been anticipated until the Messiah finally showed up in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. I think you talked about this already, that we use during one service, we talk about some of the people throughout the Old Testament. Do we use other passages from the Old Testament in our worship as Orthodox Christians? 
The backbone of Orthodox worship is the book of Psalms. It's everywhere, in the daily offices of the hours, in the Vespers, in the Matins. It's supposed to be in the liturgy, but it dropped out for the most part centuries ago, and we need to recover it, except for some little verses that are sometimes chanted at the antiphons. Uh, the, the Psalms is the book that schools us in how to pray, and my heartfelt uh, conviction as a pastor of 28 years is most of us don't really know how to pray deeply enough, and the Psalms needs to be the way in which we recover that. Athanasios the Great, the great church father, said, only through the book of Psalms can we put on Christ and actually uh, assume what, how we've been baptized and grow up into the Lord. So that's critical. Second book after that is the book of Isaiah, which co comes up in the gospel story so much of Jesus and comes up in some of the services of the church, especially when we read Old Testament at the great feast days, Christmas, Epiphany, and above all, Holy Week and the Easter celebration. Since you have been a, a pastor for 28 years, I'm sure you've led many a Bible study. <laughs> what is the number one question you get from people? Oh. about the Old Testament? Um, gee, why do we have to read this anyway? <laughs> Can't we just stick with the New Testament? It's so much shorter. It's so much easier. It's so much more appealing to me. <laughs> That's probably the most common question. And, and what gotten. led you to take such a, a fascination with it, to be so fascinated by it? When I was a theological student here on campus in the late 70s, a couple of my professors uh, observed and uh, took an interest in me and called me in and asked me questions about my future. And they encouraged me to go on for further study. And when I was asked, well, um, what areas you're interested in, I'd mentioned a few things. And then finally, because I was interested in Bible, I was directly challenged. How about Old Testament? We really need people in the church that do advanced studies in the Old Testament because nobody ever does that. Had you thought of that even before they mentioned it? Never. <laughs> it was a revelation to me. So I began taking a course in Hebrew in the summer at, at Harvard Divinity School and hated it for one week. And then I crossed a threshold and fell in love with the Hebrew language and our affair has never ended. <laughs> I've never heard anybody say an affair with the Old Testament. And I will say that the Old Testament is very difficult to read, not only because of its length, but because of the various names and so-and-so yeah. begat so-and-so. Why is all of that important? All of it's important because since the Christian faith is so radically founded on the person, Jesus Christ, and the gospel message proclaimed in his faith, above all, is suffering, crucifixion, death, and resurrection. And the life of Jesus Christ is profoundly intertwined with the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. Therefore, all of those things that informs who Jesus was is now important for us because it not only informed who Jesus was, what his purpose and mission in life was, but he also changed the way we see the Old Testament. He gave us new eyes to do this so that it becomes now relevant, meaningful, impactful, and energizing in ways for us that would never have been possible without him. It seems there are different versions of the Old Testament for different denominations, different Christian denominations. Why is that? What are the differences? Well, there are, on the one hand, different translations of the Old Testament, just of the new hundreds if not thousands, many of which can be uh, very reliable and useful because they all highlight different things. Of the original languages, uh, Hebrew and Aramaic in the Old Testament and the Greek translation, there are different versions that are read by Christians today, uh, including different uh, versions by Protestant Christians primarily or by Roman Catholics or by Orthodox. Some of those differences have to do with the fact that at least for us Orthodox, there has never been a define, a, a conciliar definition about what exactly the limits of the Old Testament is. We have shorter canons of 39 books, longer canons of even up to 52 books of the Old Testament. Isn't it generally considered 49 books? Uh, well, it is by some, but it's not universal. 
because once again, we've never had a, a conciliar definition. There's a very common designation of it being 49 from a version of the Septuagint, the Greek translation, but there's a different version the Ethiopians use or the Slavic churches have used. And there are simply dis there are different of opinions in the church fathers about what the number of the Old Testament books is. So while we share 39 basic books with Roman Catholics and Protestants, there are additional books that are called readable in our tradition, anayinoskomena, that we read for profit, even if they may not have the same authority as the main 39. But uh, then again, uh, we share all of those with Roman Catholics with some slight differences. So we have more in common with those readable books with the Catholics than we do with Protestants, but even Protestants are beginning to rediscover them and incorporate them back in their Bible because of the richness of what comes from the teaching of these extra books. Well, you've been a very enthusiastic supporter of the Old Testament. If somebody is interested in learning more about it, are there resources available for them? What would you say they should read? Obviously, the Old Testament, start from the beginning probably. Other outlets for them? Well, I would, I would begin by emphasizing that there is nothing that replaces direct contact with the Old Testament itself. Through the worship of the church, the Psalms in prayer, public prayer, private prayer, uh, the stories of the Old Testament as they come to us through the hymns of the church, the commemorations of the church. But for Christians to pick up and read the Old Testament on a regular basis is very dear to my heart and very important for spiritual growth irreplaceable. Along with that, there are growing resources in English for people. There are the resources of the writings of the fathers of the church that are increasingly being translated. There are writings of good contemporary scholarship that make the biblical resources available in ways that we wouldn't have been have prior to advances in archaeology and in biblical study that have occurred only in the last few hundred of years. Pastors now have a, a greater exposure through their education. There are the resources on the internet that are uh, uh, available. There are Orthodox writers writing commentaries increasingly on books of the Old Testament. All of these resources are, in, are going to be available increasingly in the coming years, so we have the benefit of them, but nothing replaces our own direct contact without all the other commentary on it. Father Harry Pappas, thank you so much. You're very welcome. And please return to view the remaining programs in this series, Discovering Orthodox Christianity. You can find them at youtube.com slash Greek Orthodox Church. I'm Stacey Spanos. Thank you for joining us.